What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to Strength Coach Rants. I'm your host, Connor Lyons, and today we're going to be talking about conditioning specifically for the sport of hockey because I think it really needs to be talked about. So it's that time of year. Everybody's starting sports up right now, or at least the uh, the fall and, and some of the winter sports are. Uh, you know, we've got baseball, fall ball, we've got basketball kind of starting their conditioning. Football's in full swing. Club hockey and high school hockey have just started, um, and everybody's kind of ready to go to start their seasons. I've got a lot of kids that, uh, that play hockey here at the gym because it's it kind of a niche for me. So I played junior hockey growing up, and then I played NCAA hockey, uh, finished up playing club hockey. I ran a sports performance department at a hockey rink, and I worked for USA Hockey for three years with the women's national program. So hockey is kind of a, a niche of mine, I guess you could say. I've worked with all sports, high-level sports, ton of MLB stuff, ton of NFL stuff, um, some Major League Soccer stuff, uh, but hockey, because of the area that I'm in um, and my past, it seems to be most of the athletes we get are hockey, you know, good, bad, or indifferent people not really understanding that just because somebody played hockey, uh, or like worked with the sport doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best person for the job, but I'll take it at this point. Um, that being said, hockey conditioning is in full swing, right? So the season's kind of started. They maybe I think high school played like two games this past weekend. I want to say, Club hockey has started or is going to start very soon. They've at least they've started practicing. Um, so you get a lot of coaches who want their teams to be conditioned. What's one of the biggest things you hear coaches say all the time? We won't be outworked. In hockey, it's, you know, we want to win the third period. Um, you know, and, and there, there's a lot of good things that come with that, right? It's good to be conditioned. It's good to be winning every third period, right? If you're winning every third period, it means that you've worn the other team down and you're able to outlast them and or you're just flat out more talented than them. But hockey is one of those weird sports where it's full of knuckle draggers, right? Um, football is kind of similar. Baseball is baseball runs poles. Football runs gassers and one tens. Hockey does, you know, suicides in 45 seconds worth of work because we've been told our whole lives every hockey shift is 45 seconds long. So we need to be able to go all out for 45 seconds. And they'll tell you, you know, hockey is a sport where you're going 100 percent that whole shift. Right. You're never taking time down. So you've got to be able to push for 45 seconds over and over and over and over again. And this dictates a lot of the conditioning that we see within the sport. Uh, you had probably the worst thing to happen to the sport ever was the word, uh, the movie Miracle, where they showed them doing herbies at the end of practice. There's even one scene where Kurt Russell playing Herb Brooks disciplines the team because they seem to be more interested in the broads and the stands than they were, you know, losing or, or barely winning the game that they were playing. So he kept them out on the ice after the game and bag skated them damn near to death. So that that drill gets used a lot. And what that is for somebody who's not super familiar with hockey, if you've ever seen a hockey rink, there are two blue lines, two goal lines, and then a center ice line. A Herbie is blue line back, center ice back, far blue line back, far goal line back, right? So you're going every line on the ice. You're skating to it and back to the start. It's a, it's a suicide for all intents and purposes, but people call them Herbie's because Herb Brooks really popularized it. And what USA Hockey had to do was get done in 45 seconds or they had to keep going, right? So if they didn't all get done in 45 seconds, they had to do it again, which is funny because if you're not getting it done in 45 seconds the first time, the odds of you getting it done in 45 seconds the second time are slim to none. You would literally be there all day long. And I had a junior hockey coach who did this same thing. God bless his heart, Chad McLeod. He saw that drill and we did it all the time. What they didn't show you in the movie it was uh, they did that like twice at the end of practice every once in a while. And then there was the one time they used it for punishment. But that wasn't like an everyday thing. It wasn't every time they got on the ice, <clears throat> they uh, they conditioned. It happened a couple times a week and they would do two of them with a decent amount of rest. I had the privilege when I was working with the national team um, for the uh, Olympic prep back in 2017, 2018, Blathwit was there he was one of the uh the strength coaches that kind of consulted with us and he had been around since the her brooks uh gold medal team back in 1980 and he was kind of a consultant he'd kind of pop his head in and out we saw him from time to time and i asked him and he said yeah it wasn't quite as intense as they they made it out to be in the movie but you know hollywood what are you gonna do so coaches took that drill and ran with it 
and they said, all right, well, 45 seconds, that makes sense. A shift is 45 seconds. We need to be be able to, to last for 45 seconds if that's how long shifts are going to be. <clears throat> well, the only problem with that is uh, like four, shifts are 45 seconds, give or take, depending on your position. And there's a lot that goes into that 45 seconds that isn't necessarily all out effort. And we're going to kind of go over all of that now. On average, shifts in hockey are about 45 seconds long. Now, where does this information come from? It actually comes from a study that was done uh, by, I'm going to bring up some of the information here in a minute, but uh, I, I can't for the life of me remember who it was. He ran a, or sorry, watched a ton of film <clears throat> and like time shifts, right? So the average shift at the NHL level is 45 seconds. Now within that, you have defensemen, you have uh, centers, and you have wings, right? So your forwards are your centers and your left and right wing. These two positions are, are fairly different when it comes to effort levels on the ice. Most people see the center and they think, oh, that's the guy that takes the face off. What they don't understand is that center has a ton of defensive zone responsibility. So they're skating back and forth. They always say first guy in the zone, last guy, or sorry, first guy in the zone, first guy uh, out of the zone because he's got to get back and play D. So a center's not going to be able to last quite as long as the, the rest of the guys on the ice. So what you see is in hockey, shifts are on average anywhere from like 29 seconds to around like a minute four. And you're like 29 to 35 seconds. That's your center's on average. Uh, anywhere from like 35 to 45, 50 seconds, that's going to be your wings. And then your defensemen are usually right around the minute mark because they don't have to skate nearly as much. Their offensive zone responsibility is pretty light. They don't have to do a whole lot. Uh, if you're playing a, you know, a lot in the defensive zone, they, they get pretty tired. But other than that, <clears throat> they're about a minute out on the ice. So the premise that we're starting with here is completely false. It, a shift is not 45 seconds. It really depends on what position you play. All right. The second false part of this is that an entire shift isn't 100% effort. <coughs> oh, man, that's something in my throat today. That the entire shift isn't an all-out effort. It's, uh, you know, there's a ton of different things that happen. We battle for pucks. Uh, we skate. We glide. We turn. We stop and start. Uh, we go backwards. We go forwards. There's a lot of different things that happen within a shift that are going to dictate the total effort level. And so what I'm going to pull up here uh, in this first slide or this, this first little graphic here is what they found happened throughout a shift on average. This is the percentages of the time that you're doing these things when you're in your shift. So this is the, the time skating characteristics of NHL forwards. And again, remember, this is the NHL. This is not 10U. This is not 12U. This is not 14, 16, 18, or even junior hockey. Although junior hockey, you could make the argument, is much closer to what you would see at the NHL level. You know, the higher level uh, junior uh, leagues play 20 minute stop time periods with zamming the ice in between. Um, so it, it, it's, you know, those guys are preparing to play at the NHL level, especially the major junior kids, right? Because most of those kids aren't going to college unless they're going to like Canadian university because they're ineligible to play um, in NCAA hockey. So <clears throat> this is what we have here. If you look at this, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 different like aspects of a shift that they broke it up into and what you'll see if you're watching at the very top of this list the overwhelming majority of our time is spent in a two-foot glide all right so if you've never played the sport if you just watched it a two-foot glides when you see guys like legit just kind of glide right so they're not skating they're not stopping they're not starting they're not battling they're just kind of gliding on the ice and that's 39 percent of an overall shift is played in that two-foot glide so right off the bat if you're talking about a 30 second shift for a uh, for a uh, like a, a center right that's man uh, 12 seconds of that's going to be in a two foot glide and then below that we have a cruise slide right so cruise slide is another like non high intensity kind of movement uh, we have medium intensity skating right so cruise slide is 16.2 uh, medium intensity skating is 10% uh, struggle for a puck or possession. This is where we finally start getting into the really high effort level stuff. Uh, that's battling for a puck. That's less than 10% of the time that you're on the ice. Low intensity skating is when you're just, you know, you're skating, but you're not really kind of getting after it. You Maybe you're gliding back into the play, but still moving your feet. Um, backward skating, which could be classified as high or low, right? That's going to be 4.9%, so not even quite 5%. High intensity skating, 4.6% of your shift. So if you are a defenseman, right, we're, we're talking about less than uh, less than five seconds of skating as hard as you can. 
Um, you know, two foot stationary. That's when you're just standing there, two foot glide with the puck. Um, and everything below that's all, for the most part, low intensity skating. You'll see down near the bottom, about 0.4% of your time on the ice is going to be they're going to be spent in high intensity skating with the puck. And if you've ever played the game, you'll realize there's shifts where you don't even touch the puck. So that, you know, makes a lot of sense. If you break this down, right, there's very little time where we're skating as hard as we can. It, it's more like we skate real hard. We glide or we stop or, you know, maybe we battle and then we skate real hard and then we do these other things. We go backwards. It's not a consistent 45 seconds as hard as you can go. It's really more like three to eight second bursts of all out effort followed by what we could consider active recovery. So these 45 second long bag skates are not conducive with what we actually need on the ice, right? And the science and the data point to that. Yet we still have hockey coaches that want to do these, you know, like boards and, you know, I had a coach, we would do boards and that's where you, you start on one side of the ice and you skate to the other and back. That's one, right? We'd start at one, then we'd go two, then we'd go three, four, five, six. And what ends up happening by the time you get near the end of these quote unquote, we call them bag skates. When you get near the end of them, your positioning and your skating is so bad. You're virtually upright. Your stride sucks. It's short. You're not trying as hard as you could because you're exhausted. And so there's been an effort recently um, within the past like five, six years, a couple you know, people smarter than me and better positions than me kind of preaching that we need to stop this, although it's it's kind of falling on deaf ears. There's this big disconnect between, you know, what we need to be doing and the people who understand that and what is actually happening at the like grassroots level in your 10 U, 12 U, 14, 16, 18 U that's absolutely not preparing these kids for, for the actual sport itself. So while we do have on average, 45 second uh, shifts, it's it's not 45 seconds of all out effort. It's not even close. All right. So this next graphic here, I've kind of broken down what I would consider uh, high intensity, medium intensity and low intensity, given the information we had before. All right. So if you look at this, about 4.9 percent of a shift time is going to be involved in backwards skating. We're going to be high intensity for 15.4 percent of the time medium intensity about 10.8 and low intensity for 68.9 percent of the time like if you look at this graph right it is really hard to sit there and say we need to be conditioned for 45 seconds at a time right if you're a hockey player and or a coach and you're using a like a really popular actually there's two really popular conditioning tests in hockey the first one i do not understand for the life of me uh, it's a beep test um, but then they also do 300 yard shuttles. 300 yard shuttles are are very popular because they kind of show that that lactic system, right? That ATP, PC, and muscle glycogen usage. Uh, it shows how quote unquote conditioned we are in that space, right? For that 45 seconds to a minute on average, that's about how long it takes for athletes to to do those tests, right? But the only problem is if if you're really good at that test chances are you're not really good at being fast and powerful for five seconds at a time over and over again. You're really good at being like pretty above average paced for 45 to 50 seconds, which isn't conducive to the sport of hockey at all, right? So 68, almost 69%. So let's just call it 70% of our time on the ice is spent in a low intensity skate. That's either gliding, standing still, uh, light, that, that cruise slide, that, uh, very light skating, right? And then backward skating, we're just assuming here that that's not part of it. It could be upwards of 75% because backward skating could be pretty light for some of it, right? Um, you know, I, that's probably not the best argument to make. Chances are most of the backward skating is at least medium intensity. Uh, but, you know, that would go to the, the other 10.8% that is not high intensity. So 15% of your time on the ice, you're going to be skating as hard as you can or moving as hard as you can. Because remember, this includes puck battles and battling for position. Uh, so <clears throat> for us to sit there and say we need to be like conditioned 45 seconds to go all out effort is absolute nonsense. And hopefully this graph drives it home. If the percentages in the other slide did not, uh, hopefully this will. Um, 15% of a 30 second shift or fit, let's just say a minute long. That's like 10 seconds, <laughs> 10 seconds of all out effort sprinkled in over the course of 60 seconds, right? For a 30 second shift, that is substantially, substantially less. We're talking five, six, seven seconds at a time here for a 45 second shift somewhere in between those two there. So 
try to get out of the the thought process that we have to skate hard for 45 seconds because it's not going to lead to where you want it to lead. At the lower levels of play, maybe it can because you can just be you know a team that can be mediocre longer uh, for longer, right? And you're gonna you're gonna be able to win games that way. Um, but you know if you're really trying to be the best player that you can be start thinking differently about your conditioning. It needs to be closer to like the between three and 10 seconds at a time. All right. Um, This next one I'm going to bring up are energy systems. All right. So these are important and they kind of drive home what we're talking about here. So these are the various energy systems that we use given different times that we're skating or moving or whatever we're doing. We're lifting weights, we're jogging, we're running, we're sprinting, we're skating, jumping, whatever it is. These are the energy systems that we use. Um, And you'll see they're broken down. There are three different, you can look at it like we have alactic, lactic, and oxidative, right? So the alactic is the very short, we're talking like one to 10 seconds here. This is when your body doesn't really use muscle glycogen just yet. So you don't get that lactic acid buildup. That's where, that's why it's called a lactic, right? So without lactic acid. Then we have our lactic that's for hockey players between like 10 and 45 seconds. Now, am I going to sit here and say, that there's never a time when you're on the ice and you get stuck out there for like two minutes and you feel like you're having to skate as hard as you possibly can. No, that happens. But what we're talking about are greater than the averages. We're talking the, the norm here, even greater than the norm. It happens more often than the average. Um, we don't really need to condition ourselves for like the one time every five games where we get stuck out there. A lot of coaches... You know, they, they scream and shout like, oh, we're not going to get beat in the third period. Well, what if you were just that much better in the first and second? You didn't have to worry about getting beat in the third because you're able to wear your opponent down so much because you were so better conditioned to do that three to 10 seconds over and over and over and over again. We wouldn't have to, to worry about this. We're in the third period and we can, you know, skate 45 seconds at a time. So we're going to be able to outlast this other team, right? Be better earlier. You know, you're, you're sacrificing being better earlier in the game to, to be better when it maybe it shouldn't even matter because you were so much better earlier in the game. Um, but anyways, back to that, back to the energy systems here. All right. So you get like between one and four seconds. That's just using ATP. So ATP, if you've ever taken biology or physiology, it is essentially like how we create energy within the body, especially in that like one to 10 seconds. So what happens is you have adenosine triphosphate or ATP and it breaks creating ADP or adenosine diphosphate and a phosphate molecule, right? <clears throat> so that that breaking happens that's that one to four seconds and from like that four to ten seconds and these aren't like set in stone like there's some overlap here and there uh you have creatine goes in and, and creatine phosphate um if you've ever heard of creatine I, I i hope you have it's a very very popular and, and common supplement that everybody should be taking uh like the most studied supplement on the planet and they really haven't found any downsides to it they're most all like old wives tales anytime you hear something bad about it and i'll link in the description i written an article about this about two years ago um anyway so creatine what creatine does is it goes it cruises around and it finds that phosphate molecule and brings it back to adp creating atp so the more creatine you have in your body the, the more likely you are to be able to, to capture that, like that phosphate or yeah, phosphate and bring it back to the ADP to create ATP. That's why creatine can help uh, you like get bigger because it can allow you to have higher effort levels for longer when it comes to very powerful stuff. So we're talking like jumping, sprinting, lifting weights, things like that. Uh, creatine's great. But that's, that's what happens in that four to 10 seconds. That creatine grabs that phosphate and brings it back to create ATP again and just does that over and over and over again and the more that you have the more often it will be able to do that and the the longer you'll last all right and at 10 to 45 seconds that's when we start utilizing some muscle glycogen uh, which is our body's stored sugars to create more energy we run out of that that whole ATP CP process runs out pretty quick um, so we end up having to utilize some muscle glycogen to break it down and then you know, that's where we start creating lactic acid. That's where you get like the burning in your legs. Uh, if you're skating or sprinting really hard or on a bike or lifting weights, uh, you know, your body's working to shuttle that lactic acid out into your liver via the Cori cycle to bring it back as glucose. It's a lot of science, but basically anything more than 10 seconds is going to, going to 
utilize some of that, right? And then we have what's considered just lactic, and that's where we're utilizing muscle glycogen and lactic acid in an effort to create energy for that 45 seconds to a minute and a half or a minute, uh, two minutes, sorry, 120 seconds. I'm reading that and I'm thinking minute 20 uh, for two minutes. So those are really the only energy systems that hockey players really need to, to kind of worry about. But even more so, we really only need those first three, that one to four seconds, that four to 10 seconds, and that 10 to 45 seconds. Everything after that's kind of not really all that usable for a hockey player. And well, I will say we do get oxidative over time. A game is 60 minutes long, 60 game minutes long, upwards of like two hours long we do get into what's considered oxidative where our body's breaking down fats and things like that to give us energy but that's happening when we're recovering it's not happening like when we're on the ice it's not like an immediate energy source it happens over the course of a game but we are predominantly you know a lactic and lactic within the sport of hockey and predominantly for most things we're really a lactic it's kind of like football a uh, long time ago 300 yard shuttles were like the, the, the test for football, right? And what they started finding out was, all right, well, that's like a whole different energy system than what we need. Football plays on average are like four seconds long, right? It's four seconds and it's about 30 seconds of rest and it's four seconds again, 30 seconds of rest. So you do tap into these other energy systems, but if we get efficient enough at those first two, those a lactic uh, before we kind of enter into that like lactic space, then we're not going to need to worry a whole lot about being good at, at 300 yard shuttles. If you're a hockey player or you're a football player and you're not good at 300 yard shuttles, then awesome because you're probably a pretty good hockey player um, or or football player. All right, so <clears throat> those are the energy systems, how we use them. We went over you know the the various uh, like efforts that we see on the field of play. Uh, we've gone over the energy systems and now we're going to break down what typically gets done and what we should be doing when it comes to conditioning for the sport of hockey. So what typically happens when it comes to conditioning for hockey, right? We went over earlier those Herbies. Those are very popular. Those board drills, those are very popular. Um, I had a coach one time that made us skate 100 laps around the ice because we were late. Uh, that's a popular one. Uh, not necessarily 100, but but skating laps. <clears throat> and I will say that skating laps is probably more conducive to success in the, the sport of hockey because you are – utilizing skating that you'll use within a game like there's there's really never any time where we're skating as hard as we can all the way back down the ice aside from either pushing the puck or coming back to, to back check right so that's not skating that we that we really need all that much again <clears throat> the conditioning that we need for the vast majority of the sport of the our time on the ice is that four to 10 seconds so some great things that you can do when it comes to conditioning especially off the ice on the ice again you can as a coach, like build this into the drills, build drills, even flow drills that are going to take between four and 10 seconds where they're going to have to go all out, right? That's going to be more, you know, uh, it's a word I'm looking for. That's going to be a lot more engaging to your athlete than saying, Hey, we're going to bag at the end of practice for our conditioning, right? When I played, if I knew we were bagging at the end of practice, like I pulled the shoot, I went like 70%. I'm like, I'm not going to die at the end of practice. Like, this is stupid. I'm not going to, I'm just not going to skate as hard. We'd have conversations with each other in the locker room before the game. I was a captain of my junior hockey team the second year. And we'd say, Hey, there's no heroes on this team. We all go when we're conditioning, we're all going 70 to 75%. You know where you can't get away with something like that, right? Is when you build it into the drills. Cause kids are trying to, they're fighting for, for, playing time they're they're fighting to to not be a healthy scratch so kids are going to go as hard as they can in these drills and you know if they know they're bagging then they're they're just not going to work as hard it, it is what it is so you can kind of be stealth about it and make these drills that last between four and ten even 15 seconds long if you really want to push the envelope here that will help them when it comes to actually being better in a game you know get rid of the bag skates they're incredibly detrimental they screw with uh, – I mean, if you get you ever watch a, a team bag skate at the end of practice or even near the end of practice early in the season, everybody's a little bit taller. Knees aren't bent quite as much. Butt's not as low as it should be. We're kind of slouched over like that. <clears throat> you know, it's not – it's not – doesn't look like a pristine hockey stride. It looks like somebody who's exhausted. You know what happens when we do something over and over and over again? It becomes habit. So you get these kids that – 
and, and adults. It happens with guys in the NHL and guys in the American League, the KHL, all that, who by the end of their shifts aren't skating low enough in their hips. And we can we can get better at that on the ice, but we can get better at that off the ice, like isometric holds. So not like wall sits, but maybe like a uh, like a half kneeling hold, right, where they're in almost like a half kneeling position with their knee like an inch off the ground. So they're holding that low position, you know, doing uh, half split holds where we're in uh, like half of a of a lateral split. And we raise our leg and we hold for time. Right. These types of drills are going to be much more beneficial to them being fast at the end of a shift than skating over and over and over and over and over again. Um, getting them stronger to allow them to put more force in the ground so that they don't have to take quite as much energy to stride. Um, pushing a sled, pulling a sled four to 10 seconds at a time. Like it, These things are so much more conducive to success on the ice than these bag skates are or these like Indian runs. I don't even know if that's like politically correct anymore but like indian runs or you know i think tortorella used to have his guys run like five miles in training camp like what the hell is that that has absolutely no bearing on whether or not you're going to be a good hockey player we have these coaches that use uh there's a local team here they hire this navy seal guy to do mental toughness conditioning which is another thing that all the data supports too doesn't work at all you know i know this is mostly about hockey but that applies to every sport um if you want to be more conditioned for the ice, stop bag skating, stop doing like conditioning that's going to take 45 seconds to a minute long um, and start building it into the drills. Start if you are going to condition, have them be very fast, like blue line to blue line, right? It takes two, three seconds and we give them nine to 12 seconds of rest and we do it again, all out effort, do it again, push a sled for 10, 15 yards, right? Give yourself like three times whatever, you know, work you just did for rest and do it again. We can get on the bike, but I will say the bike is one where guys just 30 to 45 seconds. Again, I it, it may be early on to set a base, but like after that, it really needs to be more specific to the short sprints that you're going to do. Lifting weights is great conditioning for sport. If we get into more of the strength endurance stuff, like say we're working at like 75, 80% for sets of five, right? more strength endurance is going to yield more speed endurance. We can utilize a dynamic effort method with a lot of the hockey players that I have. We use a, uh, a hex bar, like a dynamic effort hex bar deadlift at 30 to 40%. And we work upwards of eight reps with like 30 second rest periods, right? So that accommodating resistance with the bands is going to bring that up to like 55, 60%. And they're having to do it with speed because of the accommodating resistance. It's high volume, just like when they accelerate. And we've seen it on the ice. One of the kids I work with, like leaps and bounds better than everyone on his team when it came to uh, speed testing on the ice, right? So stop bag skating, stop thinking like 45 seconds, stop even thinking 30 seconds. It, 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 again, with the caveat that maybe early on when you're setting a base, you do some of these longer things. That's OK. I'm not saying never do any of that. But when it comes to actually pre being prepared for games, like start building that stuff into practice, start doing the short four to 10 second sprints, start, you know, pushing the sled, doing dynamic effort work. Uh, one thing I will say, do not jump for conditioning or do med ball work for conditioning. It's a huge exercise in futility. I would I would. I would say not to do that kind of stuff, but anything else where you're having to be fast and powerful for four to 10 seconds, like get after it, do it because that is exactly what you're going to need on the field to play. Right. And that's not just for hockey. I know this whole podcast episode is about hockey, but you know, that goes for every sport, football, four to seven seconds at a time, tennis at the youngest, uh, levels you're talking, um, like like between two and five seconds per point um you know basketball is a little bit different soccer is a lot different lacrosse can be a lot different um but you know your, your sports uh baseball the stop running poles right what do you what do you have to do in baseball maybe you know you're inside the park home run right how often does that happen almost never what are you typically doing you're running from home plate to first base or first base to second base it doesn't need to be this long drawn out thing when maybe you only need two to three seconds worth of all out effort and that's what's going to kind of get you there so it, it one more kind of thing here that i want to touch on a lot of times teams think that they have a conditioning issue when in reality they have a base level of strength issue 
you're not strong enough, it takes a whole lot more out of you to produce force, like to get from A to B. If we can just increase that base level strength, I'm not saying you gotta be a 500 pound squatter, like one and a half to two times body weight in the squat, maybe two times body weight in the deadlift. If we can get you there, all of a sudden, like that speed endurance is there. Right? It makes it's less effort to get from point A to point B, and you're going to appear more conditioned because it takes less out of you. Um, that, that's that's kind of my rant here. Um, we'll go ahead and close it off here. Uh, stop doing the conditioning the way you're doing it, uh, especially if you're a hockey player. Go back and rewatch this. Understand you know, the, the, the times that you're going to be doing things on the ice and the effort levels that you're going to be doing them are not conducive to the kind of conditioning that we do now. If you're a coach, understand that bagging your players is going to destroy their movement patterns for the ice. It's going to make them skate high. It's going to make them have short strides and it's not going to make them better. Um, any other sport, take a look at your sport and look at like the actual needs of the sport and don't just listen to the, the, some of the knuckle draggers who think you need to be able to run miles and that's going to make you a better tennis player or you know a football player has to be good at at you know gassers and 110s and, and 300 yard shuttles to be a good football player because it's not true All right um that's it we'll see you next time hope you enjoyed it uh next week we'll i'll come up with another topic i'm not exactly sure what i want to talk about yet but we're gonna start getting a little bit more sciencey moving forward probably and try to like break it down uh, into a way that's that's easier for most people to understand, kind of like we did today. Um, but we'll see you next time.